Alright, welcome to this video on the statistical concept of moments. All the other videos in this series on descriptive statistics are up on zstatistics.com and you'll notice that this one's up here in green because it's not part of the typical suite of measures you get when you're looking at the descriptive statistics of a variable. But it nonetheless is a really robust way of describing a data set and you also get a glimpse of moments when you deal with things like skewness and kurtosis. So let's dive in and see if we can make heads or tails of this very misunderstood statistical concept. So it's going to pan out like this. I'm going to provide you with some intuition around why moments work. And we'll look at the first and second moments here. And we'll also discover what the difference is between crude and centered moments as well. After which we'll take into account some higher order moments. That's your third and fourth moments in particular. And then assess how to adjust for sampling. And that'll involve some discussion of degrees of freedom and all that scary stuff as well. So here we go. Let's develop our intuition with the following data set, 12, 14, 14, 17, and 18. Now I could draw this on a number line and the points would exist somewhere up here, 12. There's two observations that are 14, 17, and 18. Now in both physics and statistics, we're often interested in distances. And this concept of moments is actually shared between the two disciplines, physics and statistics, well, mathematics more generally. But in both disciplines, we care about distances. And what I mean by that is have a look at these numbers, 12, 14, 17, 18. What do they actually mean? What does 12 mean? Well, it might seem like a moot point, but it's 12 units away from zero, right? And in physics, you can appreciate that, of course, we care about distances as well, because that's the physical manifestation of numbers, right? When you're dealing with things like force and levers and all that stuff, distances are really important. So how about we try to find the average distance to zero? And that's what this sum of x on n would actually represent. You've seen that before. You know that's going to be the mean when you're talking about statistics, right? But essentially, you're calculating here the average distance from zero. So another way of writing this might be to say it's the sum of x minus zero divided by n. Which would be a silly way of writing this because we understand x just to be the distance from zero in the first place. Now, this is actually what's called the first moment. And if we were to try to figure this out using the data we have, here we have mu dash one which is a way of ascribing the first moment of a distribution. That's equal to the sum of x on n, which is 15. And you can try this yourself, just add all those up, divide by five, and you'll get 15. Now that's the first way of describing this data set. If I told you that this data set on average is 15 units away from zero, you'd have some indication of where it is, right? It's up here somewhere. But keep in mind that there are other data sets as well that have the same average distance to zero. And that's this one. Imagine we have five observations all at 15, right? That quite clearly has an average of 15 or an average distance to zero of 15. So how are we going to try to differentiate between our original data set and this similar data set with the same first moment? Well, that's where the second moment might start helping us out. So instead of calculating the average value of x, let's calculate the average value of x squared. So we're going to sum all the values of x squared together and then divide by n. This is the average squared distance from zero. And hopefully you can see potentially the applications in physics of all this, right? Squared distances are useful in trying to figure out things like the area of a circle or something, right? But even in statistics, they also help out these squared distances. And this is called the second moment. And I've put in here in brackets that it's a crude second moment. And we'll see what that means in just a second. But we can calculate now all the squared values. So 12 squared is 144. 14 squared is like 196, 196. 
So you can find all these squared values, sum them up, and then divide by n to find the average squared value. And that happens to be 229.8. Okay, now get this. That alternate data set that we were looking at before, that's just five lots of 15, that has a second moment here of 225. So while these two data sets had the same value for the first moment, in their second moment, they actually differ. And the reason is, the original data set, our one in yellow here, actually has some kind of spread about it, whereas the orange data set here, the new one, doesn't. So wherever you're going to have a greater spread, you're going to have a greater average squared distance from zero. And if you can't quite intuit why that would be the case, just appreciate that when we have a variance about our distribution, you're going to have some low numbers and also some very high numbers. And it's those high numbers that, when squared, really add to this calculation. The low numbers don't detract as much as the high numbers inflate this calculation. So a spread will always increase the average squared distance. And that's true here. 229.8 is greater than 225, which is the orange average squared deviation. Now, you might ask, what's so special about the number zero? Why do we care about the distances to zero over any other point? Well, the answer is, there is nothing special about zero. It's a reference point just like any other reference point on this number line. And moments can be taken from any point, not just zero. So if we end up using zero like we have here, the second moment, which is the squared distances, will be informed largely by the first moment, which is just the linear distances. So the whole reason why the second moment's so large, 229.8, is because that first moment was reasonably big too. The first moment was up to at 15. So it's not actually telling us much independent of the first moment. So how do we remove the effect of that first moment to see what additional information we get from the second moment? Well, this is where we actually subtract the first moment from each of the observations. Don't forget that first moment is just the mean, right? Looks pretty fancy here, but you could just replace that with mu. So the sum of x minus mu squared on n will provide us the average squared distance from the mean, not from zero. And this is called the second moment, which is now centered. And if we calculate here this centered second moment, you can try this yourself, but it's just going to be 4.8. Now let's compare this to what we'd get for the centered second moment for our other distribution with the 15s. If we had five values that were all 15, clearly x minus the mean each time is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0. So we're going to get 0 for this calculation. So hopefully you can see that by subtracting the mean each time, we're getting some indication of the spread of this data set, right? When we had just 15s, we actually get this second moment now of the zero, which makes sense considering it clearly doesn't have a variance. So it's almost like we've calibrated this second moment to tell us only what's independent of the first moment. We've subtracted that first moment, so we've got a good indication now of this extra little piece of information we get with the second moment. And this is actually going to become now what's known as the variance. But let's see how all of the moments now relate. And this is where it all, I think, will come together for you. So come along with me to the next page where we look at higher order moments. So we just saw that the first two, what we'll call crude moments, were the sum of x on n and the sum of x squared on n. Now I'm sure you'd appreciate that you can quite simply cube all of the distances from zero and take all the distances from zero to the power of four and find the average of those. And yes, this would be called the crude third moment and the crude fourth moment. But as we just saw, when we centered this second moment, we got something that was more useful. In other words, when, by subtracting that mean, we're then netting out the effect of that first moment such that we're getting just 
the additional information that this second moment offers us. So you can find the centered moments for three and four as well. The third and fourth moments are going to relate to something called the skewness and kurtosis. But to get there, we actually need to standardize for the second moment. So much like how the raw second moment was kind of not very helpful because the first moment was incorporated into that. So we had to net out the first moment from our second moment. We also have to net out the second moment from our third moment. The skewness is going to end up being the third moment having netted out the effect of the first and second moments. So it's kind of like just the extra effect of that third moment. And the kurtosis would be the extra effect of that fourth moment. So therefore netting out the second and first moments as well. So what's actually happening here is that we're getting these four measures, which we can call the mean, the variance, the skewness and the kurtosis down here. Now I can already hear the questions coming, which is, all right, you've told us that you have to sort of adjust for the previous moments to try to net out the effect of the previous moments. So why don't we make an adjustment in this kurtosis equation here for the skewness above? Well, I've got two answers for that. Firstly, there are equations for kurtosis that can adjust for skewness. You never really have to deal with it really, but they do exist. And the second thing is that while the concept of variance actually requires a mean and the concept of skewness actually requires that there's a spread or a variance, right? The concept of kurtosis doesn't require a skewness. You can quite happily calculate a kurtosis from a symmetrical distribution. In other words, a distribution with no skew. Now that's not the end of the story, because as you can see, as part of these calculations for variance, skewness and kurtosis, we actually have the population mean mu and the population standard deviation sigma. Now, of course, when you're taking a sample, you're not going to have either of those two things. You're only going to have the sample mean and the sample variance. So what do you do? Well, here are those four moments as we saw them before. You don't need to adjust for the sample in your first moment because all you're doing is summing up all the observations X and dividing by N. There's actually no population parameters in this equation to worry about. But when you start getting to the second moment, as I said before, you've got this population parameter mu, which we're actually using X bar to estimate. So because we're using X bar as an estimation of mu, the degrees of freedom change such that our denominator is N minus one. Now I've done a, a pretty extensive video on degrees of freedom, which I'll put up in the top right hand corner now. But essentially for the purpose of this video, you just need to appreciate that it's this estimation we're using here, which causes us to lose a degree of freedom. And thus we divide by n minus one. And you'll recognize this formula. This is the formula for the sample variance. Now the same thing happens for our third moment, but here we're actually going to need to estimate two things, mu and sigma. So because we're using X bar, which is the sample mean and S, which is the sample standard deviation as estimates of these two, it gets a little bit complicated. You've got the N over N minus one and N minus two out the front which is that sampling adjustment. Now, I'm not going to go into exactly why it's this in particular. It is just that adjustment which counters for our estimation of these two parameters. And guess what happens when we deal with kurtosis with our fourth moment? Well, it's going to get super duper ugly because we're raising everything to the fourth power and you're never going to have to remember this. But again, I just want to show you that to find your kurtosis estimate from a sample, you're going to need to adjust for the degrees of freedom. And that's how you would do it. You got all these end terms on the front side, on the back side. Oh, that is exactly how say Microsoft Excel calculates kurtosis. So to summarize then, the sample mean is given by the sum of X on N. The sample variance is provided by this figure here, the sum of X minus X bar squared on N minus one. The sample skewness has a cubed involved with it, obviously, plus that sample adjustment. And the sample kurtosis, as ugly as that is, 
Hopefully you now understand it. It is just that standardized fourth moment, then adjusted for the fact that you only have a sample and do not have those population parameter values. So that's it. My name's Justin Zeltzer and the rest of the videos are up on zstatistics.com. And if you like what I do, feel free to subscribe to the channel. That'll help me out. And hey, tell your friends. I'll catch you around.